says, And after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. So what is God saying in his house today? He's saying to sin, come up where I am. He's been so telling us that the last few days, hasn't he? Come up, ascend to where I am. There's some things I want to show you. There's some visions. There's some revelations. There's some answers. My presence. Amen. Thank you, Lord. That's what he's saying to us this morning. Who will ascend? Who will ascend where I am? We say, come down here, Lord. But he says, come up here with me. Yes. Come up here with me. It's nice I'm down here, but come up there. The door is open. We have access through the blood of Jesus. We can enter in. We can go because of the blood. Amen. Amen. Thank As I stand here before you today, I want you to know that God is walking with you. He's walking among you. And it's not a small thing. God walks in the midst of us. You cannot worship him like you just did and God not may be among you. Thank you, praise team. You can receive it with your name. I praise your name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, don't lose the spirit of atmosphere. Don't lose this. My Jesus. My Jesus. As I was preparing the message. You know, see, sometimes you just don't know where God altogether wants to go. Your mind is all over the place and God's like, well, I want to tell him this and I want to tell him this. I want to tell him this. God has your interest at heart and he wants you to know how much he loves you. Yeah. My God. I'm going to begin with the very beginning of Genesis and as I was praying last night, I just felt God saying, I need to give them a word. I need to give them a word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Genesis. Genesis 1 and 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creeps upon the earth. Skip down with me to chapter 2. We're going to read verse 7. And the word of God says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. I'm going to tell you what. That is real to me. That is. It is real to me. That God himself. Was present. Okay. When Adam was formed. God didn't just give him a body. A spirit. And a soul. A mind to think with. He put blood in his body. But what did he put that was so vital for him to be living in the earth? Breath. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of life. 
the breath of life. Do you understand that there is nothing that is dead in God? God is a perpetuator of life. Yes. In him there is no dying. You and I have cells that die every day and we shed those things, but not so with God. Amen. There is no death in him and he cannot die. There is no dead cells in him. There is nothing about him that does not live. Amen. You serve a living God. And if you look into the Hebrew, the people of God always said the living God. Hit their enemies. They would say, how can we fight against them because of their living God? They were not even wanting to embrace the fact that their God was alive, but they had to admit that all their gods were dead. Now, in reality, we know that there's no such thing as a dead God because we know that there is no other thing as a God other than God. Right? But they had all these idols. They had all these things that was not living. It was not life. God wants us to know that he breathed into you. He was there at the time of your birth. He was there when you came out of the womb. And God breathed life into you. And you will continue to breathe until God inhales. <laughs> you are serving a God that has nothing but good to give to you. God is trying to get us to the place where we will understand that when he created Adam and Eve in the garden, that they had nothing but the living God. God. Everything around them lived. We can't even fathom a place, a garden that you could go into that you're not having to cut away dead tree branches. You don't have to go in there and snip the flowers because some of them have died. We have to do that if they're going to continue to be pretty. But not in the Garden of Eden. Amen. There was nothing but life there because God created it and what God creates lives. Amen. Now I'll tell you some time ago I had a situation where I was involved in a school. I was doing a school of the prophets and as I was looking around it looked like it was just drying up on the vine. Now there were plenty of prophets around that just weren't coming. Nothing that I could teach, nothing that I could do would cause them to come. So I asked a friend of mine, I said, what do you do with that? And he said, well, if it's not working, then I usually shut it down. Well, let me, the, let me give it to you the way that God put it to me. God is like, well, you know I'm alive, right? Well, Sarah, I know you're alive, right? So he says, what I make live, no man can kill. Amen. Hallelujah. But what I'm not in, it cannot live. Right. Right. So when God has given you assignments to do, he breathes upon it. He breathes upon the assignment that he gives to you to accomplish. The assignment that we get from God, God says, I need you to go out and do this, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. And we're sitting back and we're seeing in and of ourselves that we are unable to accomplish it. God, I'm not qualified to accomplish it. God, I'm not equipped to accomplish it. It's not about our qualifications. It's not about our equipping. It is about the living God. And that when God gives this to you, it can't be done because as you step, whew, glory be to Jesus. As you step, the, the, the breath of God, the wind of God is going with you. Now, if you're standing still, how is that breath going to move? Now, I want to go just a little bit farther. Chapter 3, verse 8. 
You there? Say amen. amen. And the word of the Lord says, and they, what? Heard. They heard the voice of the Lord God doing what? What was the voice doing? When God speaks to you, it walks. When God speaks to you, you move. When God speaks to you, the wind of the God that you serve goes with you. If you're standing still, how can it be walking out what God has already assigned for it to do? Let me tell you, I was out raking leaves one fall. And I'm praising God as a, every stroke of that rake. And I began to see how that everything has a cycle. Billy Brown wrote a book on the blood and the glory. And in there she talks about there being a circle. How everything is in a circle. And she said, the rain comes down and it evaporates back up. And the rain comes down and it evaporates back up. Jesus came down. Went right back up, right? You have blood in your body and what does it do? Circles around and around and around. If you looked at nature, what do you see? Things are not square. Things are round. Okay? So we're talking about a God that, that you know, all this stuff is going around and around. And so I, I kept thinking about it. I said, wow, you said that you sent your word and that it could not come back to you void. Yes. The word has, oh, you see, God's word walks. And it walks throughout the earth. And when a word is given, it has to be performed before it can go back to heaven. God. I want you to get a bigger picture of this. Go with me to John before I tell you this. This is a very familiar passage. But it is something that I just go back to time and time again. Because John 1 and 1 it's so powerful. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Now, oh, if you can understand, you remember in the beginning, Genesis 1 and 1 says, And God said, Let there be. God's voice went to walking, and it went to performing that which it was sent to do. So as I'm praying and I'm raking the leaves and I was beginning to say, God, there have been prophecies, there have been assignments in the earth yeah. Yeah. that people, when they heard it, they turned a deaf ear to it and they said, I don't want to do that. I don't want that assignment, God. We have people that profess to be Christians, but when God gives them something that he wants them to do, they say, well, I can't do that. She says, I can't do that. Why? Because they are looking at themselves because they have a small God. They have a God that is dead. If you understand the living God that you serve and how his voice walks in the earth, Amen. How that everything that he breathes life into, it breathes. If he says it dies, it dies. God wants you to know that he has already given you a word. And he wants you to step out. And walk on it. I want to go real quick to Psalms 104. 
Hallelujah. 104 and 3 says, and I'm just going to start with the first verse because it's all good, right? <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and with majesty. Who covers yourself with light as a garment. Y'all talking about the same God that I'm talking about? Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Who lays the beam of his chambers in the waters. Who makes the clouds his chariot. And who walks upon the wings of the wind. God's voice can walk wherever it wants to walk. And if you understand that God can be anywhere he wants to be, if he wants to go to the pits of hell, he can go in there and he can bring out anybody he wants to bring out. God can go anywhere, in any dimension, in any realm, in any thought. God can go anywhere he wants to go. And he can bring life to anything that is dead. And speaking of that, y'all remember the story of Sarah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And how she had a dead womb. Yeah. But when God is in something, yeah. it cannot remain dead. Right. Yeah. It had to live. Yeah. And it produced fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that God does, it has to produce. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Get yeah. a tip over to something real quick and just tell you that there's another message that I've preached on before and it talks about the master has use of you okay so in this message and I'm not going to read all those scriptures to you even though they're all good I don't want to keep you up here all day but you remember when the disciples were walking with Jesus and Jesus said I, it is time for us to celebrate the Passover so he sends his, his disciples into the city. He says, I want you to go, and I want you to speak to a man. And this man has a, what was it, a colt or? He had a donkey. Okay. He had a donkey, and he said, go and tell him that I have need of the upper room. Now, I'm paraphrasing it, obviously. But when they got there, the interesting thing was, the man said, I just got through cleaning it. Let's paint a bigger picture for you. We're talking about a Passover feast. The wealthy people had upper rooms. The prominent people had upper rooms. And it was designed for them. Jesus wasn't classified as a wealthy person according to, you know, the people that he was hanging around. But the master had use of it. Jesus didn't have to have any money. All he's got to say is, I have need of that. And all he's got to do is say, I have need of you. And when he immediately, when he spoke it, the man said, it is available to him. You see, whatever that God has need of, it just is. So when Jesus saw the fig tree and the fig tree had withered up, he had a need for the food. And when the tree would not produce food, even though it was out of season, there's no time in God and it was supposed to have produced fruit and he called that thing accursed and it died. We must be about our father's business. We're talking about a God who speaks a thing, who makes the clouds his chariot that he rides in, or he may say, I can just walk upon the wings of the wind. Yeah. Jesus could walk upon the water yeah. because it didn't matter where he was, what he did. He could skip on top of the mountains. He could, he could be better than Superman and jump from one mountain top to the other if that's what he would have wanted to do because there was nothing that was impossible to him. You're serving a mighty God. Yes. Somebody say mighty God. Mighty God. I want to take you to some place because sometimes we don't step into 
what we're called to step into because we don't understand, as we talked about last night, that our thoughts get in the way. But when the thoughts get in the way, the tongue gets in the way. Amen. Now, let me see where I want to take you. Go with me to Revelation chapter 8. And I'm going to read from verse 3. We'll go here first. And the word of the Lord says, And another angel, If you know if you've got another one, there's already been a bunch of them, right? Mm -hmm. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Verse 4. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God <clears throat> out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire, of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Now go back to chapter 5 verse 8. Huh. Hmm. And when he had taken the book and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, this is where I want to go. In the earth, and you know, this whole weekend has been a lot of revelation because I want you to see that when you become a Christian, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he is a living God and he comes into your heart and he's coming to, to remove everything that's dead to put in new life, okay? Because you're getting ready to go to the other place, right? But you are already changed from, from mortality to immortality. You're not waiting until you get up there. You're not waiting until this natural body died. You are already in immortality. So, Get this, your prayers in the earth can be heard. Yes. And we can see the manifestation of those prayers. Yes. But what if you could understand what it looks like there? Wow. What if you could understand how it looks before the throne of God? Because your prayers ascend to the throne of God. And if you look back at me, with me, in chapter 8, it says that they have, the angels have a golden censer. And there was given to him much incense that he should offer with the prayers of all saints. Now, there was a golden vial that the prayers were held in. Y'all know science, right? Everybody had science class, right? You know that there's such a thing as matter, right? So if your prayers can be held in a vial, they're tangible. They're heard here, but they're tangible. They are tangible there. Not only can they be seen, from the natural eye up there, or the spiritual eyes rather, they can be smelled. They can be poured out. So if you know anything about water, water has a liquid form, it has a frozen form, it has a gaseous form, right? You can pour it, you can drink it, you can bathe in it, you can do it. What can your words do in heaven? What are your words doing? Because we go back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that God says we're going to make man in our image. You were made in the image of God. You were created to be able to speak a thing 
and it come to pass. Amen. Whenever you are speaking a word and God said, this is what I want you to speak. Because remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to speak my words, but I come to speak the words of the Father. And whatever I hear him speak, I speak it. Amen. And whatever that he's doing, Praise I'm going to do it. Yeah. All right? So God is speaking through you. And you're supposed to be speaking it out. But some of you are afraid that you're not hearing God. And you're holding that thing. And you're not releasing it. But what happens is it, it will turn and leave you. And it will go to somebody else. Because God's got a word that's got to get out. And if you won't give it, then that word is going to look for a place that it can come out. Do you understand? Yeah. Yes. God is saying to us, he says, I need you to, to begin to act upon what I have given to you. Yes. Some time ago, I had a dream or a vision. I think it was a vision. And I saw this creature. This creature was, was um, it was big. It was really big. It was like, uh, let's see, you could take like a skyscraper. And this thing would be towering over a skyscraper, right? It was really, really big, and it only had one eye. Just really strange, okay? And, and I came to understand the vision afterwards. But it had only one eye, and I watched as this thing was walking around into the city, and it was looking for a church. And he would lift, he would, he would do this, and he would grab a hold to the, uh, the roof of the building, and he would pull it up, and he'd look down in there. Nah. And he'd put it back down. And he'd go over here. Nah. And he'd put it back down. He was looking for a place to go. And what the Lord showed to me, he said, this is a word creature. This is a word creature. And the single eye meant there was a single vision. Not a dual vision. There was a single vision. And he was looking for a place where the word could come and rest. You see, God, if God walks, his word's got to rest even. And it looks for a place, a resting place. So your prayers, they make it to heaven. And sometimes you say, I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and God has not heard me. It doesn't mean God hasn't heard you. Sometimes he's going to wait for it to get all the way full before he's going to empty it out. You don't know at what point in time God says, okay, well, that's good enough. Because you know what he does? Sometimes he holds that because he's got to train you in some things. He wants a people that will do what he's wanting them to do because he's got a word that's got to be performed. He, if the word comes into the earth, and I told you it can't go back void, it's looking for a place. And wherever this word goes, it brings life. God's word walks upon the winds. God's word walks into the hearts. God's word walks into the minds. God's word walks into the spirit. God's word walks into the soul of man. God's word can walk wherever he sends it to go. But when it goes, it's going to bring life. I'm going to go back to Exodus. My Jesus. Do you feel the presence of the Lord here today? My God. You see, Moses, Moses had an experience with God. Hmm. My Jesus. In verse, in chapter 33, that's where I want to go. 
God and Moses were talking. And God has already given him this huge assignment. Now, Moses was a single man. I'm not saying he was a single man. I'm saying he was one man to lead millions of people. Can you imagine how daunting that would be? And all by himself, he was going to have to stand up against Pharaoh. How intimidating could that be? And facing him after he had fled the country 40 years before after he had committed murder. Yeah. It was a sticky situation. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, when Moses saw God on the mountain and he saw that the burning bush lived, he saw a living fire, he obeyed God and he went and did and God says, go, and I'm going to go with you. In chapter 33, second verse says, And I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite, the Hevite and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go in the midst of you, for, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. God is telling Moses, he said, look, I'm going to send you into this country. And he says, and I'm going to send an angel before you. He said, but I'm, I'm not going to go. And y'all think about that for just a moment. Mm -hmm. God says, I'm not going to go. Um, I'm going to send an angel before you. Hmm. Verse 4 says, And when the people heard these tidings, evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up. Huh. Huh, she put up her I will come up into the midst of you in a moment and consume you. Therefore now put off your ornaments from from you that I may know what to do to you. Hmm. God is saying, don't be a stiff necked people. What is stiff neck? You're stubborn. You want your will instead of God's will. You want your ways and not God's ways. God is saying, I've given you an assignment, but you won't do it. That's stiff neck. Your neck won't turn. You won't go in the direction that God wants you to go in. Mm. But it goes on. And it came to pass in verse 9. As Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Let me, let me go back up verse 8. And it came to pass when Moses went out of the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. I'm going someplace with this. You see, we can be a stiff-necked people, but where Moses was able to go into the tabernacle to experience the glory of God, if we're not following God, if we're not walking where his voice is walking, then if we've become a stiff-necked people, then we cannot experience the glory that God wants to give us. Amen. God is saying, I want it. I'm not saying that you're doing that, but all I know is that God is saying, give them a warning not to be a stiff-necked people. If God has given you an assignment to do, if God has given you a word to speak, you need to be about your father's business. Verse 11, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua 
The son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. He was so happy to be in the tabernacle. Skip down with me. Verse 14, and he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15 says, and he said unto him, now this is Moses talking to God, if your presence does not go with me, carry us not up hence. Hmm. You understand that? Yeah. You see, Moses had a personal relationship with the living God. Amen. With the God who breathed life into everything. And when God said, speak to the rock, the rock just gave water. Right. When God spoke and it said, I, they need food to eat, God spoke and the food happened. Because the everlasting God, the eternal God, the immortal God, the God who is the God of everything, He speaks and it happens. Yes, he does. Great God. Ha. Says, My presence shall go with you, but I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, If you're not going, I don't want to go. I'm like that. God, if you want me to go, I'm ready. But if you ain't in this, I don't want to go. Because Nada will get Nada in trouble. Just say it. But when I'm with God, all things are possible. Mm. Let's go on down. Verse 16 says, For wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Moses was asking, said, How do we know that you're gonna have we're gonna have grace? Is it not in that you go with us? So shall we be separated, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. So he said, I'm getting ready to make a personal appearance to you, Moses. But they are stiff-necked people, and I'm not going to appear to them. Mm -hmm. Verse 19 says, and he said, I will make all my goodness. Mm. And he said, I will make all my goodness. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. We don't know how good that God is. When, we, when God says, all oh, my goodness, that's a whole lot of goodness. <laughs> and I will proclaim, get this, it says, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Yes. He said, but you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Wow. He said, there is a place by me, and you shall stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory side, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. I want you to know that in God, everything is so perfect, everything is so holy, everything is so alive that it would consume the natural body because the natural body is of the Adamic nature now. And it can't go there. So God was saying, I, your spirit man can handle it, your, your soul can handle it, but your flesh can't handle it. And there was some time ago, some years ago, I remember God gave me this poem. And I, as I began to write it, I was talking about the love of God. That even the love of God, just the love of God, would totally consume us. The love of God would, is a fire. And it would totally consume us. So I can't imagine if God says, I'm going to make all of my goodness. Skip down with me in chapter 34. Verse 5 says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, and there proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now I want you to get what's happening here. I, wanna, I want you to see the privilege of what you've got. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses, and the Lord proclaimed his own name. Let me just make it plain to you. The Lord proclaimed his own name because there was no one that was holy enough, righteous enough, good enough to proclaim his name. 
So there was nobody to introduce God, and as a as a as a mighty man, as a king, would never come without having been introduced. This is the king of Salem. This is the king of whatever. This is the king of Israel. This is the king of Judah. They were always pronounced of who they were. They were a mighty person in the earth. There was, there was no such thing as a king coming out and him not being pronounced who he was. But there was none that was holy enough to proclaim the name of the Lord. And so God says, I'm going to proclaim myself. And this is what God said about himself. Mm. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, ha, ha, she did it see, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Yes, and Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, I if now if now I have found favor in your sight, if I have found grace in your sight, O oh Lord God, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. He did all of that because he wanted to appeal. He was making an appeal to the Supreme Court that the people of God would not just have an angel that the Lord God Almighty would go with him because he knew that the Lord God Almighty was the ever-living God and he wanted him there. You know, Moses didn't make it into the promised land, but I'm not so sure that that wasn't by his choice. God, if you ain't going, I don't go. God had a whole lot of warnings to them. But this is where I want to go. God has given you a voice. He's given you, He's given, I'll show that all over again. He's given you the right to proclaim His name. When you were in your trespasses. As the Bible says, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, you still could proclaim the name of the Lord God Most High. And you didn't die for that. You had the ability to come before God just as you were, just as you are right now. Are you totally cleaned up? I'm not. Am I perfect yet? I'm not. I'm a work in progress. But this I know, that God has allowed us to proclaim who he is. I want you to see this. I'm almost done. When you begin to pray, because you know that your voice is walking in heaven, right? You understand that now? That your voice is in heaven and that it can be heard, it can be seen, it can be smelled, it can be held. Your voice has the ability to proclaim the name of the Lord God in the earth and you can shift the atmospheres. You can change things just by your words. But the problem is that you don't believe it. God rebuked me one time and he said, if you would just believe half of the things that you pray for, why can't you just have faith in the things that you've asked me for? It is true. We pray many things and we're begging God, but in our heart of hearts, we know that we don't have the faith for it. We're wanting God to answer us, but we're not believing in faith. But understand this, that your voice is walking in the heavens. And just as the man says, Lord, I know I ain't got enough faith, and I know I'm not believing as much as I ought to be. Lord, help my unbelief. Some of us ought to be praying, help my unbelief. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. God is saying, if you will just pray that, because he, just as like he gives 
wisdom liberally if you ask. He will give you belief if you will ask him. Because he is the living God and he can do it. He wants to do it. He delights to do it. He wants to go with you. He wants to give his word through you. He wants to change the world through you. He wants to do a lot of things because your voice is his weapon in the earth and you can do it. You're serving a living God. And wherever he goes, he tells you to go, you can go. Whatever that he tells you you can do, you can do. Believe it. Believe in your own prayers. Ask yourself, because the Bible says this. Let me give you a little tool here. The Bible says this, that if you ask anything in my name, you know, be to ask any one thing. Well, you know the scripture. What about this one? When you pray the will of the Father, So let's talk about both points, okay? It is not his will that any should perish. So if you're praying for somebody that's not been saved, mm -hmm. how could it not happen? Unless you just don't believe it? That God is dependent upon your belief? God is saying, proclaim me. Proclaim me. I'm with you. Proclaim my word. Say it. Do it. Say it. Believe it. Walk upon it. Can't. Never could do anything. <laughs> and won't. Won't ever do it either. God. God loves you. God loves you. I want you to stand to your feet. You serve a mighty, able, awesome God. You serve a living God. You serve a God that loves you more than you love you. That's really true. He's already died for you. Right, right. He's already been resurrected. He's already interceding for you. He, he already made a plan for you before you were ever born. And then he showed up at your birth to ensure that it was going to happen. But I give you this one more thing. Some time ago I had, and it's just been more than once, but some time ago God gave me a dream. And I can see on the people of God, engraved in Hebrew, I say engraved, it was written in Hebrew, it was in ink, but it was written on your skin. It was written who you were, who you are, your assignment was written in Hebrew upon your body. In the in the natural you don't see it. In the spirit realm, it's there. I can't read Hebrew in the natural. But in my dream I already knew that whatever that, that assignment was, I already knew how to accomplish it. I went and did it, and as soon as I did it, it's just like the ink evaporated. It was in, it just, it was just gone. And as I went into prayer again, God gave me the next one. Wow. And when I came out of prayer, it was written all over me. Now y'all know, like I know, that if God can see that, y'all know the devil can see it. Oh wow. Yeah. He knows your assignment. Why do you think he's fighting you so long? <coughs> mm -hmm. He sees what's going on. He's not dumb. Mm -hmm. He's been around, although he was sort of kind of dumb. He messed up, didn't he? But mm -hmm. I don't know what God is telling you to pray today. But I can be assured of this one thing. You already know. 
I go back. God does not have a communication problem. No. He never had a communication problem. He speaks every language, every dialect. You can be with your own language that nobody knows about, and God knows it. He knows every thought before you think it. My God. My Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, I just thank you. I pray for your people this morning, Lord, that they, Lord, have eyes to see. Lord, that they have ears to hear. Lord, that they have the courage to act upon what you have given them to do. God, you have given them the rights. You have given them life. You have atoned for them. You've bought them. You've paid them. They are not their own. They belong to you. Lord, I thank you right now. Lord, that you're shifting their mindsets. Lord, that you're invading their thoughts. You're invading their heart. And every ounce of fear. Lord, we come against fear in the name of Jesus. Where they will hold their tongue. And they will not release the word that God has, Lord, that you have put into them. Lord, I declare and decree, Lord, that they will release that which you've given to them, that another man, Lord, does not take their crown. God, I pray right now, Lord, that they will come before you, Lord, just as they are, Lord, but they, Lord Jesus, will submit themselves unto you, that they will surrender themselves to you. Could we have the musicians up here, please? Or if we've got music, but they don't have to come, that would be fine too. Either way. If, they're, if you're that one that has been struggling, because God has given you a word and you've been afraid to speak it. I want you to come forward this morning. No shame in my game. Some time ago the Lord spoke to me. He said regret is never as real as it is in hell. Mm -hmm. Regret is never as real as it is in hell. And pride, pride will get in your way. But it's too late if you're regretting it in hell. Ha. <laughs> There's some other people that there's some things that you need to I'm just going to say it. some things that you know that you're supposed to have already done. You've already repented but yet the enemy has put guilt upon you. I need you to come and surrender that guilt today. You see Jesus died for the guilt too. 